This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. They come to the eighth ball, and California Chrome is absolutely sensational. California Chrome shines bright in the Kentucky Derby. Multi charge is surging, and it's a photo finish. It's too close to call. African Story wins the Dubai World Cup. Mojo, Mojo Man! Broadcasting live from the Capital OTB Studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning and welcome to the Thursday edition of Racing Across America. I'm Seth Merrill. Thanks for joining us. Coming up a little bit later on the show, it's Thursday, our regular visit from John DeSilva. We'll talk a little New York racing for this afternoon. Also, look out. They have a really nice uh, card of state bread stakes races on uh, Saturday. So we'll take a look at a couple of those, the Mike Lee for the three-year-olds and the older horses and the commentator. But it really is a nice card down there, again, of some New York bred stakes races, the kind of competitive and fun looking uh, down at Aqueduct. So we'll talk a little bit about that also with John. And then a little later on, our first visit from Gabby Gaudet. Uh, you may have recognized her from uh, Paddock commentary down in Maryland since uh, last fall, I think, she, she started there. She has now moved for the summer out to Arlington. We're going to put her in the mix for some Arlington thoughts from here on in on Thursday uh, mornings. So we'll have Gabby on board a little later on to give some thoughts for uh, Arlington for this afternoon. Do want to, uh, uh, again, keep reminding you because we're, uh, you know, 10 days away now or whatever, but Belmont Stakes Day, if you want to come down here, and let's face it, it's always fun to come down and enjoy an event like this in a crowd and the big cheer and whatnot. So if you're thinking of uh, viewing history and enjoying Belmont Stakes Day, come on down here and the screen there, you see uh, all the events coming up in June as well. Uh, and one of those is Belmont Stakes Day here at the Clubhouse Racebook. Call up, make a reservation. The reservations have a seat here on Belmont Stakes Day, $5, but that includes admission, a $1 win bet on California Chrome, a photo of California Chrome, and a Belmont Stakes glass as well. Call 438-0127. Again, the number 438-0127. Make your Belmont Stakes Day reservations right down here at the Clubhouse Racebook. There will also be a Belmont Stakes Day bankroll. Uh, that will be uh, administered by Brian Nadeau. A $1,000 bankroll on behalf of 50 uh, Capital Bets account holders. They'll be uh, selected, uh, 25 selected randomly. 25 new Capital Bet account holders will also be selected between May 28th and June 4th. And then the uh, 50 lucky account holders will participate in that Belmont Stakes Day bankroll. There'll also be a Belmont Stakes Day syndicate. You can participate in that. You plop a little money in. It all gets put together. You put your uh, selections in. They all get totaled up and uh, the, the money gets bet according to the way the uh, group wants to bet. But everybody kind of pools their money together. That's fun also. And don't forget, also coming up in June, if you're a player of the Capital OTB Handicapping Series, the June edition, the King of the Hill will happen on June 14th. So keep that in mind. And if you haven't played yet, come on down and hop in uh, with the June edition, the King of the Hill, June 14th. And again, the uh, Handicapping Series happens right down here at the Clubhouse Racebook, 7-Eleven Central Avenue in Albany. And again, go to capitalotb.com anytime to keep up with all the events and promotions happening here. Pulled up uh, as uh, Jeff was doing some of the handicapping at the end of the handicapper support, I just pulled up Dave Grenig's tw uh, Twitter feed just to get an idea if any uh, Belmont related uh, works or whatnot were happening. And sure enough, they were. Uh, Grenig reports that uh, this morning tonalist looked good in a strong gallop, a touch slower than a two-minute lick in what looked like a uh, one and three-eighths mile gallop. Uh, also, after schooling in the paddock, California Chrome galloped the tad more than two miles, picking it up in the last half mile or so, just like always. Uh, this was uh, kind of interesting. Coming through the second time, the left hind bandage on social inclusion came loose. After pulling him up, the rider got off to remove the bandage and Grenig subsequently uh, 
tweeted, social inclusion being let off the track by the groom appears at this point, no harm, no foul, but that's interesting. And also Matuzak galloped a solid mile and three-eighths after schooling in the gate. So there's just a few updates uh, live uh, via Twitter from Dave Grenick down at Belmont Park regarding some of the Belmont Stakes uh, contenders. Yesterday, uh, down in New York, there was a, uh, a meeting of the New York uh, Reorganization Board. Um, mixed bag, there were some numbers that weren't so good. A lot of it earlier this year blamed on weather. Uh, some of the numbers were okay. There was some optimism looking forward to uh, the Belmont Stakes. And, of course, with a triple crown on the line, how seating was going to work out. They mentioned some additional seating they have planned, uh, which uh, w was a little bit pricey. Um, but uh, again, there was a, a little bit of a mixed bag coming out of that meeting. Uh, over on Equidaily, I have linked both a uh, re recap of the meeting from the Daily Racing Forum and a recap of the meeting from our friend Teresa Gennaro. She wrote one for the Blood Horse as well. But it'll give you, if you're interested, and again, it, it was kind of interesting just to see what they had to say on some of the various changes that have been made. Uh, how uh, early in the year went and uh, what they're looking forward to on Belmont Stakes Day. But you can get the full uh, recap, as I said, and go through both of the recaps because they cover a little bit of a different material as well. Have them linked both on uh, Equidilly. Again, that meeting was yesterday, New York Reorganization Board down in uh, New York City. This is kind of interesting. Uh, Santa Anita put out a press release uh, within the past couple of days. Um, they had a contest, I, I, assuming it must have happened day of the Santa Anita or just before the Santa Anita, and uh, a 71-year-old resident of the Air Santa Anita area, Eddie Espinoza, has a chance to win a million dollars if California Chrome wins the Belmont Stakes. And he's already done pretty well. Uh, California Chrome obviously winning the Santa Anita Derby, so... Uh, uh, I'm assuming this was a random drawing. You probably went to the park that day, put your name in, or in the week leading up, whatever. But Eddie Espinosa, the 71-year-old racing fan, was chosen. So subsequently, he had a $5,000 win bet that he uh, uh, had on uh, California Chrome. When he went to the Kentucky Derby, that got up to a $7,500 win bet. And this is all via Santa Anita. This is a Santa Anita contest. They've provided all of this. Uh, and in the Preakness, it was a $10,000 win bet on California Chrome. So, so far, Eddie Espinosa has racked up $49,000 already. So he's got to be a happy guy as the contest winner uh, going in. But to top it all off, if California Chrome wins the uh, Belmont Stakes, um, Eddie Espinosa becomes the winner of uh, Santa Anita Contest and wins $1 million. Uh, and I think that... I'm looking for the name of the actual contest. It is something like the Santa Anita Millionaire uh, Contest, but uh, stands to, to uh, pick up a cool million. So uh, that, they're going to be rooting hard. The, the California Chrome Connections are going to be rooting hard, but uh, so will Eddie Espinosa, and it's interesting. Uh, part of the contest, they flew him to the Preakness, and he went and watched there, but he is choosing to watch the, uh, the Belmont at Santa Anita, he's going to have uh, a front row suite in the Eddie Logan, a front row seat in the Eddie Logan suite out at Santa Anita. So he'll be watching uh, from uh, essentially his home racetrack. And congratulations to him. Uh, and a fun story in that the horse wins the first two legs, goes into the final leg, and uh, Eddie Espinosa, a chance to win. Uh, you know, just a, a regular guy, a racing guy, racing fan, chance to win a mil million dollars if California Chrome manages to win and sweep the Triple Crown. Interesting story out of Northern California the other day. Interesting in that, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had that nasal strip, uh, that slight controversy uh, in New York. Would California Chrome wear or not? And part of the uh, story behind that was when nasal strips were fairly new. They were banned in New York, essentially a house rule, because the officials wondered, well, what do you do if the horse is in the paddock and makes it out to the racetrack? It's raining. The strip falls off. Do you inform the public? Do you scratch? The, you know, there were, there were those various concerns. Um, but it, virtually every other jurisdiction allows it. New York, subsequently, when this came out a few weeks ago, they've changed their position as well. But then, strangely enough, coincidentally, there was a stakes race uh, over the holiday weekend out at Golden Gate, the Grade 3 All-American. 
and one of the horses that was supposed to be wearing a nasal strip shows up uh, in the paddock without it. The trainer became very concerned, immediately got on the phone with the uh, stewards, uh, and as the uh, Racing Forum art article says, vociferously voiced his displeasure. Um, the stakes runners all have guards assigned uh, to stay with them from 8 a.m. in the morning of the race until uh, the horse leaves that area. And it seems the guard refused to let the groom put the strip on the horse before leaving the barn. So the horse showed up uh, in the uh, paddock without the strip. Uh, the trainer didn't notice it, didn't even, wasn't paying attention, didn't notice it till later. Stewards actually told the uh, trainer he could go out on the track uh, before the horse went into the gate and put on the strip. Stewart chose not to do that because he just didn't know whether that was the right thing to do after the horse had warmed up and whatnot. But, uh, you know, the horse subsequently ran and, uh, you know, they were obviously owner and trainer were concerned and the stewards are now looking into the situation and whatnot. But it's just kind of interesting to show uh, uh, there are some legitimate concerns with, uh, with regard to the nasal strip and, and how it you know, practically works out in certain situations. That was what New York was looking at and why it wasn't allowed for years and years. And then they, they go with essentially what all the other jurisdictions are going with. And subsequently, just a few days later, out in Northern California, we see a nasal strip story come out, uh, you know, the, the worst case scenario kind of a situation where the horse that was supposed to be wearing it wasn't wearing it. So it, it can happen. So we'll see. Uh, Going to head into the first break right now. As we do head into the first break, I pulled up a little video put together by the uh, America's Best Racing folks, the America's Best Racing website. And it was a nice, it was a professionally done uh, piece. And it's just it kind of it'll put a punctuation on the Preakness for us. It's called uh, Triple Crown Bound. And, and it's just a piece they put together a couple of minutes long, leading into and then winding things up with the Preakness. It's just some shots, nice musical background of the lead up to the Preakness and the Preakness itself kind of a, a two minute look at Preakness weekend. As I say, it'll put a punctuation on that as we're now a couple of weeks away, less than a couple of away from the Preakness and less than a couple away from the Belmont. So I just thought it was a nice piece that they uh, posted on the America's Best Racing website just a few days ago. And we'll take a look at that as we go to the first break. Just wrapping things up now for the Preakness and uh, the blinders will be on as we get into uh, Friday and next week certainly heading to the Belmont Stakes. But leg number two of the Triple Crown, the Preakness, with this America's Best Racing video. We'll take the break. When we come back, John De Silva. Stay tuned.
On Preakness Day, no one brought you more insight, more analysis, and more information crucial to the professional horse player than OTB TV. With live coverage from Pimlico, including Pimlico track announcer Dave Rodman, HorsePlayerNow.com's Brian Maddow, and none other than California Chrome's exercise rider, Willie Delgado. Each with their own expert analysis and first-hand look at track conditions and early morning workouts. So for the very latest racing news and opinions, keep it right here on OTB TV. Affirmed, holding ahead in front, and Ali Dar on the outside is challenging again. The build-up to most races or most events, quite often the result is anticlimactic, but that can never be said about the 1978 Belmont. Affirmed's got a nose in front as they come onto the wire. The crowd at the Belmont that day, they saw the heart of a true champion. There are races and there are events. On Saturday, June 7th, experience the richest day in the history of the Belmont Stakes. The Capital OTB Handicapping Challenge Series is back. That's right, the 2014 Capital OTB Handicapping Challenge Series is back and it's your chance to win thousands in cash and prizes and a seat at the 2015 Handicapping Championship in Las Vegas. This month's contest is the King of the Hill on June 14th. So sign up today online at CapitalOTB.com or stop in at the Clubhouse Racebook. Using CapitalOTBBet.com is as easy as one, two, three. One, simply log on with your username and password from the homepage. Two, fund your Capital OTB account through our Easy Money, Green Dot, or Visa MasterCard options. And three, place your bet on one of our three easy to navigate wagering platforms, Capital Bet TV, Capital Bet Express, or Capital Bet Pro. CapitalOTBBet.com, log on today. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Thursday morning. Very happy to be joined now by John DeSilva, RacingWithBruno.com. Good morning, John. Good morning. How's everything today? Very good. And, uh, John, uh, before we get into some uh, discussion of Belmont this afternoon and the weekend and whatnot, I just want to go back because I'm trying to, I've been feeling out people all week long uh, on what was the big news story of the Memorial Day weekend. And can you believe from January until the day before and the Rainbow Six gets hit by uh, Dan Borislaw? It's unbelievable how all this time and effort people put into it, especially for Monday. And then here's Borslow, who is able to take advantage of a quirk. Now, I don't know what the plan was, what the mentality was. I was a little surprised that Gulfstream maybe didn't try as hard to take advantage and try to make more money. Like, let's face it, that second race is a 12-horse field. I thought it should have been in the rainbow sex instead of the two-year-old race with the six-horse field. They had a couple of seven-horse fields. But I guess their mind was, let's try to guarantee multiple winners by having sure the field. Yes. Realizing that Gennady Dorochenko, for the third time during the meet, one with an uncoupled entry with longer price of the uncoupled entry with the two-year-old. And I think that was exactly it. I think they were trying to put together an easy card on Sunday and in, uh, what I thought was too tough of a card on, on Monday because I thought, you know, with the little guys having put a lot of money into the pool, that card Monday was tough. But I think they thought they were making an easy card on Sunday and just some crazy things happened and some of the, the uh, short-priced favorites it just got bad trips and whatnot, and it just kind of fell into uh, Dan Borislow's lap, given the strategy he had. But we, on yesterday's show, we showed the final race of that sequence, and the horse that ran second would have provided for the carryover, and that w it couldn't have been a closer finish. And I uh, had Ron Nicoletti on with me Monday morning, 
Uh, and I said, uh, how many Gulfstream executives had to be pulled off ledges last night? They just had, they had to be heart sick. Oh, they had to be heart sick because I know Stronach was at the track on Sunday. They were all making preparations. And it was just unbelievable. I mean, I liked that horse. You know who ran second? I think he was my top choice when I did my picks for Bruno, and I was heartbroken. But I didn't even realize that he, that it was going to hit because I was just watching races. I wasn't even trying to pay attention to it because I didn't play that day. Because like many other people, I thought, let me just relax, take it easy, get everything in for Monday, and that's one of the problems. People relax. He didn't have as much money, and he didn't have as many people be as aggressive, unlike Borslow, who took advantage, he was aggressive, he got rewarded for it. Yeah, I think people were keeping their powder dry. And then I was also surprised uh, by the size of the pool on Monday. As it turned out, it was a best case scenario on top of the worst case scenario. Yes, they, they lost that shot at the $10 million getting put in, but I thought over 700000 was put in was pretty amazing. And I think it was a combination of a lot of people had already done the work, and I'm wondering if there were also some people who just didn't realize it had gotten hit on Sunday. And so then once it got up to about a couple hundred thousand, I put my ticket in. You know, once you could see they were going to play into it, I put in. And, I, I, and so that they got 700,000, as I say, was the best they could have hoped for. They, they had a, a fairly good scenario on Monday regardless. Well, you also had some syndicates who have put the monies together, and they probably yeah. realized, instead of just giving the money back, if everybody's okay with it, let's just go for it and see what happens. Yeah, and so it was, it, but it was just an absolutely strange story as for all week long, people are anticipating in the last possible day that could have happened, it, it gets picked up. So, uh, but racing moves on, that's the way the game goes. And we'll move on, take a look at uh, Belmont for this afternoon. You've got a few ideas for us, and we'll also look out at the weekend. I mentioned earlier, really a nice steaks bread, uh, a nice state bread steaks card on Saturday. We'll take a look at a couple of those also. But today we'll kick off with the fourth race, which in fact is a state bred uh, maiden special weight event. They're going to uh, be three-year-olds and up going six furlongs on the grass. What did you see in the fourth? When we talk about grass, we usually talk about two names. Chad Brown, Linda Rice. And when it comes to a turf sprint, we definitely talk about Linda Rice. And we're going to go with the first time Linda Rice horse here, number four old friend. This is a horse who began the career at Keeneland going seven furlongs. Uh, had a little bit of a trouble start, ran very greenly, didn't do anything. Now it goes into the rice barn. It's a New York bread. Taylor picks up the mat here, so you know she's familiar with the horse. She's been on the horse in the morning. And when you get Linda, first time Linda Rice on the grass, it's still actually sprinting, very dangerous. That's 5-1. to one, I definitely like that price. Yeah, 5-1, to one, as you say, on a uh, trainer who is in her comfort zone, so I agree. Fifth race this afternoon is a conditional claiming event. 20 tags, non-winners of three lifetime, the condition. Phillies and Mayors, three-year-olds, and up. They'll go the one-turn mile on a 16th. Basically, it's a two-horse race here, and I'm going to go with the high price of the two horses, which is number one, two blue hens. Now, this is a horse who was claimed out in California by Roddy Valenti, shipped out here to New York, and basically, you know, Shows some ability in the start allowance. Now drops back down to the $20,000. Now wins the three lifetime. Adds blinkers, drew the rail. Manny Franco, who's done very well since losing the bug, keeps them out here. And I think this horse is definitely going to show improvement. Is at the right level? I mean, the start allowance is probably a little bit too tough for this horse. But right here, now wins the three. I definitely like it. Yeah, you made a great point. I think they got just a little bit ambitious on the move to New York, and this horse is probably much, much better spotted today. So two blue hens in the fifth. Let's move out to the finale today, race number nine, another conditional claiming event. This time the tag 16,000, non-winners of two lifetime. Phillies and Mayors, three-year-olds and up. They're going to go seven. Now, this is a very unusual situation. I don't know the whole story behind it. But uh, we're seeing James Cosaris as the trainer here. Now, I'm not sure what relation is James is in the whole Cosaris situation, but when we look at the horse, you know, we see over my head at one point was trained by Steve Cosaris, as in base the parts of Miguel Vera. Um, now James Cosaris takes over training. I looked at that base. 
Um, Gage Glissaris has a star of the horse since 2008, so I don't know if this is an assistant for Steve Glissaris. In the past, we know that Steve Glissaris had Lillian Altieri as his assistant, but Lillian Altieri is now Lillian Glissaris, but she is now training on her own down at Gulfstream Park while Steve is up here in New York for reasons we won't get to publicly. But the situation here is you got Edgar Prado riding, who, by the way, is represented by Bobby Clasaris. So it's a whole Clasaris family <laughs> situation here. I think at 8-1 to one over my head, we ran second for 10,000 parks last time out as a favorite. Definitely fits in here, and hopefully I can get a nice Clasaris family, some type of relationship victory. It's nice, and uh, 8-1 to one on the morning line, and yeah, as you say, a little... Claceris clan uh, all at work in there. We'll see what can happen in the finale. Now let's take a look out. And again, on Saturday, really is a nice uh, card of state bred stakes races down at Belmont. Some nice full fields, some kind of fun competitive races. And I pulled up a couple for us to take a look at. Always like to look at the Mike Lee. It, it kicks off that uh, Big Apple Triple, which then goes to the, the uh, uh, New York Derby up at the Finger Lakes and the Albany at Saratoga. And I think they have kind of a fun field in here uh, today and John while we talk I'm going to go back and uh, take a look at the Gotham number 1A Samrot will win the Gotham Samrot of course pointing for the big race next weekend down at Belmont but Uncle Cy is going to run a very very close second in here as the number four horse so again Uncle Cy behind Samrot in the Gotham back in uh, March of this year Uncle Cy will be the number four on this video. And Uncle Cy steps out of open company, a fifth place in the Wood Memorial, a 14th in the Kentucky Derby, back into state bred company uh, this Saturday. And obviously on that, he becomes the horse to, to pay some attention to. But Empire Dreams to me is kind of interesting, and a horse that's in some good form. Swell off of uh, that last race, which was uh, the first start of 2014. I think Loki's Vengeance is interesting off the uh, New York Stallion race win last time. And Captain Sirius, two for two now for uh, Mike Hushin, also uh, kind of interesting. So as I say, it's an afternoon with some fun races, and this three-year-old uh, race that kicks off the Big Apple Triple is one of the more interesting races. What were your thoughts on the Mike Lee? This is a tremendous race, and Mike Lee, we've seen heavy favorites get beat in the past. Now, everyone is going to be looking at Uncle Cy for his efforts in the Gotham and the Withers, but we have to remember a couple of things here. Number one, this is a horse who has only one career start sprinting, and the horse lost. The horse shows his best races, showing good speed, but going two turns, and as we've seen in the past, when you go two turn speed, that doesn't necessarily translate late to sprinter speed. So he's going to be going a little bit faster here. So if Uncle Cy is going to be going off three to two or less, that may not be the top bet you want to be making. You do have some other horses that you mentioned as well, who's been working up a storm up at Saratoga, likes to come from off the pace. I mean, you got Loki Vengeance, who won the Stallion Series stakes last time, going six and a half so long. Captain Sirius making his stakes debut, you know, has Shown good speed, but also can come from off the pace. I mean, it's a very intriguing race. It's definitely, to me, the top of race you want to spread, but I'll probably be looking at the outside horses here. Yeah, the two Mike Hushin horses, I agree, off of their, both of their last races, the buyer numbers, and it just seems like there are a couple of horses that could prove very interesting in here. And as you say, Uncle Cy may be the kind of horse, given just the scenario of his career, that might be take, worth taking a little bit of a shot against, because you know coming out of the wood in the Kentucky Derby, he is going to take a lot of action on Saturday. All right, let's shift our attention a little bit later in the card, look at the uh, older horses, three-year-olds and up, the commentator uh, handicap couple of hundred thousand dollars on the line. They will go uh, a uh, flat mile, one turn down there at Belmont, of course. And John, while we talk in here, pulled up uh, April 26th allowance optional claiming win by Zevo. As we watch this race, Zevo will be the number eight horse. I think Zevo's kind of interesting in here, uh, just off of the, the uh, win streak. Uh, brings in a four race win streak. Um, Seven wins and 13 lifetime starts. Chad Brown trains, has shown an, an affinity uh, for uh, Belmont with a couple of wins and four starts here. But uh, you have Prohibition also kind of interesting off a nice uh, high buyer figure win down at 
uh, Parks last time. Read the prospectus. I think off the layoff a little bit dicey, but has done well in this type of competition before. Weekend Hideaway comes in off a nice number last time out in uh, state bread stakes here. Pinball to me has some nice speed, but the last three have been on the turf, so that may be the question mark. And Bernardo off his last race is also interesting. So again, a nice big field. I think this is going to be a competitive, fun event. Your thoughts in the commentator? This is going to be a great race. I mean, you have last year's winner, Reed from Prospectus, coming back. Hasn't started since October, but the horse has been working pretty steadily up at Saratoga for Chad Brown. And yes, people, Chad Brown can win on dirt. You know, <laughs> some people may not think that, but he can win not as good as he does on grass, but he definitely knows what he's doing on there. But to me, Reed's Prospectus could be very dangerous. I mean, weekend hideaway ran very good, just missed by neck in the firm success last time out. That could be a horse who might get overlooked here. You may want to give it a little bit of a shot to. I mean, Zevo, and what can we say? That's Chad Brown again, has won four in a row. Um, Steffi is going to get a nice pace to close into here. Um, you have to respect it as well. But, again, in these type of races, you know, try to get a little bit of value in. Obviously, to meet Chad Brown, he knows what he's doing. He's got two entries in here, but I think that also tells you that, hey, he can't put one on the other. He's not even going to try to, so might as well go both and whoever wins, wins. Yeah, it, it, again, it, lo it looks that looks like a good race, and it's just, I think, a nice card overall. A Saturday down there with some nice uh, state-bred stakes races. They all look kind of fun and competitive. And, John, before we let you go, just, uh, you know, we're a week away. We'll get some more thoughts next week. But uh, uh, early uh, Belmont thoughts. It, 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 Looks like California Chrome is ab absolutely loving the Belmont Strip. I like what I see with California Chrome. He's doing everything the right way, possum and all. I mean, granted, you want rabbits, but not possums. But, you know, what are you going <laughs> to do? But this is uh, what racing needs to bring the attention. Now, whether he gets the job done is another story, because as you've seen, the racing gods just ask Gulfstream Park, they'd like to fool around with you and drive you crazy. Now, the way I'm looking at it, will I use California Chrome? Of course, you have to. Is he going to be over bet? Of course. But at the same time, you have to respect it. But when I'm going to be making my plays next week, I have to spread it around a little bit. Everyone is in love with Tonalist. I just hope that his feet are healthy. And because that mile and a half could do a number on your feet. But the one thing we all have to remember, these type of races, the one one closers usually don't win these races. You're not going to see a birdstone type of move that often. So, hold a commanding curve where I think he's going to get a lot of money could be a disadvantage, which to me makes me wonder what Regime Mara is going to do. Wicked strong. Does he try to keep him a little bit closer up, or does he still go with the one run move? move? And let's not forget the horse I've been saying you have to respect. The horse I have been calling Drosselmeyer Jr. in Commissioner. Because you remember Commissioner, you know, is now a great thrill. You didn't know what to do. They added blinkers to show a little bit early speed. Same thing with Drosselmeyer. But then they both ran second into Peter Pan. And then Drosselmeyer was pretty close to the pace than normal at 13-1 to and won the Belmont. Who's to say the commissioner can't do the same thing? Yeah, it, it, it's shaping up to be a fun event. Uh, obviously, California Chrome, a great story. But uh, uh, regardless, we have, we've had three weeks of some nice coverage. It's only going to ramp up next week. That's got to be great for racing. I think there's going to be a huge crowd down there, a nice undercard. So we're looking forward to it. And as I said, we'll get some more thoughts next week. John, as always, we appreciate the visit. Good luck this afternoon. We'll talk to you again. You got it. Take care. John DeSilva, RacingWithBruno.com. We'll take our next break. When we come back, Gabby Gaudet from Arlington Park. Stay tuned. This is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. The future of online betting is here and only at the all-new CapitalOTBBet.com. CapitalOTVBet.com delivers a state-of-the-art wagering experience found nowhere else in horse racing. CapitalOTVBet.com. Log on today. California Chrome has won the Preakness! And that elusive prize, the Triple Crown, awaits California Chrome in the Belmont Stakes. The dream continues.
continues. The Triple Crown dream is still alive. And the best place to be when it happens is the Clubhouse Racebook, 7-Eleven Central Avenue, Albany. You can also be part of the action by visiting one of our Easy Bet or branch locations or bet online at CapitalOTBBet.com. Fascinated by the world of horse racing? Interested in honing your handicapping skills? Class is in session. Night school, Monday nights. Easy to access online. It's free, interactive, and informative for the casual and serious race fan. Horse player now buzz. Live horses to watch email to you daily. Our eyes, your prize. Night school in the buzz. Visit horseplayernow.com for details. Funding your capital OTB bet account is as easy as one, two, three. One, easy money. Clearly the fastest and easiest method of depositing funds into your account. Make deposits or withdrawals in just minutes. Two, Green Dot Money Pack gives you instant access to your funds. Green Dot Money Packs are available at thousands of retailers nationwide. And three, MasterCard Visa. Simply click on the link from the funding page, enter your account information, and fund your account. CapitalOTBPet.com. Log on today. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 7-Eleven Central Avenue, Albany. Welcome back to Racing Across America. Happy to be joined now by Gabby Gaudette from Arlington Park for the first time. We're going to plug her in on Thursdays and get some info on Arlington Park as the season progresses. Gabby, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Happy to have you on board because uh, certainly a lot of folks like to play Arlington Park. A lot of obviously good racing out there and it ramps up as the summer moves along, of course. Uh, before we do your first visit with us, just wanted to get a little background. You actually come from a horse racing family, correct? Correct. Yes. Um, my family, everyone in my family is involved in horse racing in one way or another. But uh, my dad was a longtime trainer on the East Coast recently retired and my mom and sister are also in the business so definitely grew up in the horse racing industry around maryland and uh, i know from a couple of summers ago you come out of the very productive clancy brothers school of racing media i did yes i spent uh, the past two summers pretty much working for the saratoga special up at saratoga so i'm definitely going to miss the boys this summer um, but I think Arlington is a good replacement. Absolutely. And, and as I say, they produced uh, Travis Stone, the track announcer down in Monmouth now, who worked for the special. And, and there's just a number of people have moved through uh, and done some work for them and moved on to positions in the industry. Uh, you started doing a, a paddock uh, analysis uh, this past fall down in Maryland. How did you enjoy it? Did it take you a little while to get into the grind of things? I, I'll tell you personally, I, I watched uh, most recently uh, – uh, Laurel and Pimlico over the past few months. I think you do a great job. I think you're kind of a natural, but did, did you feel natural as you got into it, or did it take a little while to, to get into things? Well, uh, the veteran, Frank Carulli, really <laughs> had to help me at first. Um, so I pay a lot of credit to him for really teaching me in the beginning before he officially retired. Um, so in the beginning, yes, I would say it was a little uncomfortable, but as the meet progressed and as I started to, you know, find my own niche of handicapping and um, things like that, I definitely got more comfortable. And throughout the winter at Laurel, especially, um, and even at Pimlico, I, I felt much more comfortably. And it's, you know, it's a progression. And um, I, I love Maryland, though. You know, it's my home. And it's really interesting once you figure out the nuances and the little subtleties of each trainer track jockey and um i feel like that's how you have the most success when you pay attention yeah exactly I, i've said the same thing when you bring your experience to the page uh, and the what's printed on the page you're now adding something too that's when you can also maybe find a little value and whatnot how long have you been out at arlington now i've been here well i was out here for opening weekend so derby weekend and i came back to maryland for the two weeks throughout the Preakness, and then I'm back here now, officially. Very, very good, and, and I've never been, but everybody who has says that Chicago's a great city. How are you enjoying it? Absolutely, you know, yesterday was actually my first day to venture out and get to downtown Chicago, and it was beautiful. And we've had fantastic weather here lately, so 
Um, even, you know, around the Arlington area, it's, just, it's gorgeous out here. You definitely come out and, and check it out. Yeah, it, again, I've never been, but all the word is, is that for Arlington as well. Beautiful track worth visiting. Uh, just before we uh, head into some thoughts on today, I wanted to go back to last weekend. Nice uh, trio of stakes races last weekend. Earlier in the week, we've taken a look at the Classic and the Hanshin with a couple of other guests, but I thought we'd take an opportunity with you to look back at the Matron Grade 3 event that was run last weekend, $150,000 on the line, mile and an eighth on the uh, main track, and it was won by Latia. And Latia, uh, the 8 to 5 morning line favorite, and I guess the betting public just looked at the past performances and said this horse has all the speed and that's the way it played out we'll watch the stretch run here and Latia the number three horse does uh, win it and win it pretty easily again on the front end so talk a little bit about Latia and also this horse won on the front end you've been out there a while now are you seeing any track biases to pay attention to Honestly, it's definitely something you have to consider, and you have to watch the first couple of races to see how the track is playing. Um, that day, I would say it was uh, relatively uh, fair for that day. Um, there were other days that were pretty much heavier bias. Um, but Latia, I mean, just has the class of the field, and she loves the surface, the all-weather surface. And there was a little bit of a concern coming into the race um, for Armando de la Cerda because rider change, E.T. Baird hopped aboard for the first time. Um, obviously, he's a very good rider for speed and out of the gate, so that wasn't a concern. But she was coming back relatively quickly after kind of a subpar effort going very, very fast in the race before. So that was kind of a question mark. In addition to that, there was, you know, some uh, hurdles, I guess you could say. There was a horse who had to get his, her shoe fixed prior to the race. So it was hot. You know, the Phillies and Maris were just circling around the racetrack. So there were a couple different things. So for her to overcome that and go gate to wire in that impressive of a fashion, I thought it was a very, very good race on her form. Yeah, we saw the stretch run, and she did win very, very impressively. So we'll keep our eyes on her going forward. And again, before we get to this afternoon, I just also wanted to touch on trainers and jockeys. And... Uh, Florent Giroux, I pulled up the stats uh, yesterday from Equibase. Florent Giroux doing very well early in the meet. 20 wins, uh, James Graham at 14. So Florent has opened up a little bit of a lead early. Uh, Manny Esquivel is uh, sitting in third position. Over on the trainer side, though, boy, I, when, you talk, when you just talk about Larry Ravelli, you have to have on the oven mitts. He is red hot. So uh, give us some of your impressions, the jockeys and the trainers, to keep an eye on. Absolutely. I mean, for starters, Larry Ravelli has just been absolutely sharp with all facets. I mean, especially with his young horses, you look at it first time starters and you know that when they open up with some money on the board, you know that that's the right way to go. And he's just been firing on all c cylinders, but rightly so. I mean, you know, you look at the form and you try to beat these favorites and they are just so well placed, so well conditioned that it's kind of hard to um, go against the grain here especially speaking about Larry Ravelli but um yeah Florent Giroux he's doing fantastically and you can even see it in his riding he's riding very confident races and very smart races and I think that's giving him the tipping edge and his ROI is actually pretty decent it's not like he's winning on all favorites usually mid-range like four four to one five to one shots so He's riding very, very well right now. Yeah, that's interesting when you talk about the odds because he's a guy, uh, I typically play a number of tracks around the country, and when I've seen his name before, he's not one of those jockeys I'll necessarily put a check mark, uh, you know, one of the, the, the big names. So when I saw he was on top, I was a little bit surprised, but maybe that explains uh, some of the prices, although if he keeps it up, that will certainly change. <laughs> they'll, they'll start coming down. The betting public doesn't take long to catch on. All right, let's take a look at uh, this afternoon. You've got three ideas for us. Uh, and Gabby, uh, we do a handicapping show just prior to this. And my assignment today was, in fact, Arlington Park. So maybe we'll have a little matching of the minds today. And we'll kick things off by taking a look at the fifth race, which is a state-bred allowance event. Non-winners are one other than Phillies and Mayors uh, on the turf. Uh, in this race, I thought cracking good pins, the two-to-one uh, price, morning line price, look kind of interesting. The concern for me was the layoff, but that bullet workout on May 10th kind of signaled some readiness to me. And I thought Mission Storm might benefit from the seasonal debut, having shown some nice speed. A bad fade late, 
But again, it was the first start off a layup. I think that horse may uh, hold that speed a little longer today. So for me, two and seven were up on top. How did you see the fifth? I agree. You know, the two cracking good pins, I think, probably has the back class of the race. However, the big question is, is she going to need a race in between the layoff and um, this effort here? And as you said, has some really good workouts in the morning, but um, just, you know, it's a kind of a low percentage with similar layoffs coming out of the, the barn here. But obviously, going a mile and a 16th is also a concern first off the layoff. You know, if they're going a mile on the turf or perhaps, you know, five furlongs or something, that's not so much of, of a case. But the other thing that I kind of was worried about with the favorite in here is the four seconds out of nine starts um, on form. So she kind of likes to not get up at the end, I guess you could say. So um, that's my only concern with the two. I think the seven is really intriguing just figuring out from a trainer's perspective. And even, I mean, Tammy Domenowski has been firing on all cylinders as well, especially on the turf. So last time out, I was surprised that she actually showed that much early and I, I think it was a case where there wasn't a lot of early speed, so they thought they'd just send her and go, and obviously that didn't work out to her advantage. But today I think she might be able to get a little bit more pace in front of her and rate from off the pace because that's really how this turf course has been playing, it closers and stalkers. So another thing that I thought was interesting is that they protected her in the waiver claiming last time out. So first off the claim she wasn't eligible to be claimed and they're protecting her again in this restricted or obviously a state bred illinois bred a other than so i think um you know there's a little bit of a confidence edge coming out of that last race it could have easily dropped her into a different condition um so i'm going to the seven mission storm in here um and i another kind of horse that's kind of intriguing you're going to get a big price on her if she actually shows up and that's the four bonita rita and her back form is just really lackluster. I mean, you look at some of her form sprinting, so she's really going to have to step it up to the plate. But past two starts where they finally gave her added distance to the two turns, she's much, much improved. So maybe they figured something out with her, and she's a type of filly that's on the incline. And I wouldn't put it past Armando de la Cerda to pull an upset as well. I like that. I think you picked up on something there. She's definitely improved with the move to two turns. So as you say, maybe they figured something out and the horse has gotten a little bit of a, a light bulb moment. It's 12 to 1. Certainly worth thinking about throwing into the mix. All right, let's go out to, uh, before I do race seven, I didn't ask you at the top, what's the weather like out there today? It's nice. It, we got a little bit of rain last night, but it should be sunny, seven, mid-70s. Um, and very nice weather. Excellent. All right, race number seven, uh, claiming event 10,000 to 12,005. Uh, these are three-year-olds and up. Again, they're on the grass at a mile and a 16th. And uh, Gabby, in this race, I took a little bit of a shot with cars and trucks at five to one because I thought the drop uh, class-wise off of that last race at Tampa, and again, you have a really nice bullet work coming into this. So Cars and Trucks was interesting to me, as was Mech Dancer. Again, another one getting perhaps a little bit of class relief. And I thought likely to improve off the seasonal debut on the yielding turf course and the move over to Manny Esquivel today. So I had five and two on top. What did you think in race seven? You stole the words right out of my <laughs> mouth. I went two, five exact in here. Um, I really do like the five cars and trucks, as you mentioned, and should have the, a lot of tactical early speed, which I definitely like. Coming off a little bit of freshening has a nice bullet work, as you said, best of 24 that day. So, And lately paying attention to some of these horses that have been coming out of, say, Tampa and Gulfstream. Tampa has been actually the more reliable uh, track that horses have been exiting and coming to Arlington and really maintaining form. So that's what I like about cars and trucks is that he, he was a good third last time out behind going to market. And that horse is a pretty decent type, uh, like allowance, optional uh, allowance type runner. So pretty competitive field in the last, and all considering taking a drop to the 12-5 level this afternoon. I think he's going to be very, very interesting. Um, the two, Mech Dancer, again, um, the only question is I think he needs kind of a t firmer turf course. So we have had some rain over the past couple of days, probably dried out nicely. I would imagine that it's uh, probably going to be rated as good this afternoon, um, which I think he's fine with. Just the yielding, I don't know. Some some of his performance are a little subpar, but 
second time off the layoff, I think he's going to get a nice stalking trip with the five and the eight having speed in front of him. And like I said, that's really how the track, the turf at least has been favoring. I like that. A meeting of the minds. That's always a positive for uh, me. So the two five exactly. We can take a look at that. Now let's look out at uh, race number eight this afternoon. Another conditional claiming event. 25,000 tags. Non-winners of two lifetime. A bottom mile on the turf. And in this one, I, I took a little bit of a shot again. Four to one on the morning line. Number seven, flattering touch. Uh, Brugerman and Midwest. Obviously crafty players of the claiming game. Um, this one does move up off of uh, a, a claim down at uh, Oaklawn. I like Oaklawn shippers this time of year, but Gabby, I'll tell you, you, you mentioned Tampa a minute ago, and we're in that period here on the show where we're adding some folks as some of these spring summer meets open up, and over the past week, week and a half, you're about the fourth person who has said, watch the Tampa shippers. Uh, this time of year, I like, <laughs> I like Oaklawn, and this year, fairground shippers to me have been interesting, but as I say, uh, one of our guests from Delaware the other day, Fort Erie, they both pointed out Tampa, so everybody ha now has to particularly pay attention to those Tampa shippers, no doubt about it. But again, I like the Oaklawn uh, shippers this time of year. Flattering Touch does that. Book Club underneath on the class relief was kind of interesting to me. But your thoughts in the eighth? I as well like the seven Flattering Touch. That's going to be my top selection for um, the eighth race. And if you look at some of the back form going long on the turf, I think it's actually quite decent. I mean, obviously we go back to December at Tampa was the last turf attempt against the allowance company was just beaten over two lengths for that effort. They had a pretty decent field. So, I mean, definitely getting a class relief, in my opinion. And this horse is going to be fresh off time away. First off the claims as well is very, very sharp. He knocks that about 23 to 25% first off the claim. So all, all directions point to yes here, especially at 4 to 1 odds. So I'm going to go to this horse. Another horse that's exiting Tampa is the 10 Gabby Curum that I'm going to look at as well. A horse who she actually beat last time, Archer Queen, I'm familiar with at Pimlico. I saw her run. She broke her maiden for maiden 30 on the turf at Pimlico and then next out was second for non-winners of two at 25 at Pimlico against a pretty decent bunch. So I thought that that race last time out was actually sneaky good here and Tom Proctor, I mean, you got to respect the, the barn there. So I went 7-10 in here. I'm going to respect the 6 as well. Book Club uh, comes out of that third length, or sixth length defeat last time out, but stretches back out to the mile, which I think is much, much better. Uh, the only thing that I don't like is that watching her come down the lane, it's, you don't see a nice kick from her. So hopefully Florent can kind of relax her from off the pace and get her going the last final furlong. Sounds good. So again, we have a, a little bit of a medium of minds on top. So uh, I'm rooting for you this afternoon uh, to get it done. And I, that'll mean I'll have a decent day myself. But Gabby, uh, we certainly appreciate the visit. We look forward, as I say, our uh, uh, viewers certainly like to play Arlington Park. There's a lot of turf racing out there. It's a lot of fun. There's some value. So uh, we'll, we'll be happy to have you in on Thursdays, giving us some more insights. Thanks for the visit today. Good luck this afternoon. And we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Thanks. Gabby Gaudet from Arlington Park. And it looks like, yeah, well, I guess we'll, we'll keep rolling here and then uh, just roll right into the end of the show. And to do that, I'll just uh, pull up the... Uh, the Penn, we talked about uh, on the handicappers report a little bit, the Penn National card on uh, Saturday night, which is going to include that very nice Penn Mile. But... It, this is a, a nice card they have, uh, and, and stakes racers are kind of loaded earlier because it is a night card, gets off at 6.05. I think they're trying to take advantage of not, uh, not letting the, the uh, simulcast folks get away as some of the afternoon tracks wrap up. This will kind of overlap, and they kick things right off in the opener Saturday night down at Penn National with the Penn Oaks. Um, $100,000 going a mile on the turf for three-year-old fillies and ready to act for uh, Chad Brown comes in off of a couple of wins. Most recently, the Beaumont uh, down at uh, Keeneland. That was on the synthetic, but this horse has done well on the turf before. Uh, you also have Aurelia's Bell, uh, Wayne Catalano. Uh, was in the Kentucky Oaks last time, but prior to that, won the Bourbonette Oaks uh, uh, down at Turfway. Uh, hasn't tried the turf yet, but again, on the synthetic, the turf way ran very well. You also have famous Alice comes in for Tommy Proctor from Santa Anita. 
Pennsylvania Governor's Cup. Uh, I was disappointed that uh, Ben's cat did not show up in here. I thought they were talking about this as a possible start for him, but this is five furlongs on the turf. Nice uh, field in here, married to the music. Uh, is in, also cross-centered in another race, however. Tight end touchdown, who won this race last year. Stormy Rush, who is racing very well right now, coming out of a uh, uh, minor stakes win down at Gulfstream Park. Great attack also, a nice uh, turf sprinter. A little bit later on is the Mountain View uh, handicap for $200,000. Valid is uh, certainly going to be a contender in here, but this is kind of a nice field. You had la last gunfighter for Chad Brown. Hasn't raced since uh, winning the Hawthorne Gold Cup last November, but this is a million dollar earner showing up down there at Penn National. Tap Town, another very talented horse. Golden Ticket, who of course we remember up here from Saratoga and the Travers, another million dollar winner. Percussion for Todd Fletcher, and then again the Penn Mile uh, for three year olds going a mile on the turf. Bobby's Kit in the morning line favorite for Chad Brown. Ken and Sarah Ramsey comes in off a dud in the bluegrass, but had been racing well on the turf before. So I'm just gonna look at this as maybe, well, it was a grade one event, the bluegrass, but also maybe didn't like the synthetic. It ran very well on the turf prior, but it's, it's a nice field, Stormy Inti, Divine Oath. Uh, so nice card uh, at uh, Penn National on Saturday nights, uh, including and in support of that Penn Mile, which was added to their schedule last year in a very crafty spot on the calendar to, to uh, play into that uh, subdivision of three-year-old turfers and they got a nice field again this year. All right, that's going to wrap things up for Racing Across America for this Thursday morning. Let me just remind you one more time, uh, Belmont Stakes Day reservations available $5. That gets you admission, $1 win bet on California Chrome, photo of California Chrome and a Belmont Stakes glass. Call 438-0127 to uh, make your reservations for Belmont Stakes Day right down here at the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue in Albany. Again, that wraps things up for Racing Across America for Thursday. We're here every weekday from 10 until 11 a.m. A little earlier on the Handicappers Report, Jeff Carl and I took a look at Arlington and Belmont Park. Hopefully we gave you some good ideas. So enjoy the racing this afternoon. Cash some tickets. We'll see you tomorrow morning. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.